it's like really interesting because he didn't really host any fundraisers for like two months and then in, in the spate of this past month has hosted uh, eight, including maybe about six in the past week. Welcome to Reporter's Notebook, where we talk to the Washington Examiner's top journalists about the stories breaking on their beats. I'm Jim Antle. I'm joined today by White House reporter Naomi Lim. Naomi, President Biden has really hit the fundraising circuit pretty hard. Talk a little bit about what he's up to and as he's trying to sort of close the gap and get through this fundraising crunch time. Well, fundraisers are always really fun for reporters because it's when he speaks most candidly right. um, to people that he, you know, really relies on for their financial and political support. Um, it was really interesting to me because he delayed uh, the campaign launch from after the State of the Union till April to help maximize his time between these like fundraising deadlines, which this month falls on Jan oh, June the 30th. Sorry, this quarter falls on June the 30th. Right. Um, and it's kind of funny. He's like maybe like a reporter that leaves his deadlines like to the last minute because mm -hmm. every had, every <laughs> good reporter does that. I know some of my favorite <laughs> ones. Yeah, too. you know, not yeah. talking about me at all. Right. No. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's like really interesting because he didn't really host any fundraisers for like two months and then in, in the spate of this past month has hosted uh, eight, including maybe about six in the past week. Um, and so what they're trying to do is try to really, um, I guess like fundraising this early in terms of before an election is more about momentum as opposed to the practicality of things. But sure. um, you know, there are expectations that they're gonna need to raise $2 billion. Right. For context in 2020, uh, the president and vice president Kamala Harris raised about a billion. And what the campaign really points to is the fact that 600 million of that is from small donor donations. Mm -hmm. So what they're trying to do is just sort of put all put as much money in the piggy bank as they can, um, particularly why they can fundraise off of a Republican primary that is talking about national abortion bans and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and so that's what's happening now. And then on the flip side, Republican candidates are also trying to fundraise because they've got a debate stage um, that they want to get onto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and one thing that the, certainly Biden and Harris can say is that relative to former President Donald Trump, they did okay fundraising last time. Yeah, I think, well, there was always this talk about how Donald Trump is he a self fundraiser or is right. he fundraising, but definitely um, they out fundraised him last cycle and so they think that that's an advantage. But it's kind of interesting looking at some of the early reports that we're getting from the House and Senate um, campaign arms because, you know, it's sort of split. I think on one side, uh, Republicans have out fundraised Democrats and on the other side, um, it's been the reverse. And so it's sort of interesting whether the structural versus like political advantages and how they are, uh, are playing out. Mm -hmm. And so there's something else that could really help with fundraising. You're going to see it in a lot of Democratic and liberal group fundraisers. And President Biden has really been in sort of uh, a competitive mode with this other branch of government, the Supreme Court. And I wasn't sure where you were going with had, that, but yeah. I, I, I never really am sure where I'm going with it either. You know, I'm not, I'm not a normal host. And President Biden says this is not a normal Supreme Court. <laughs> exactly, I see what you did there. See? I know. Um, well, it's kind of interesting because we thought that abortion, particularly before um, the midterm elections, would taper out before people actually made decisions and casted uh, ballots. I mean, right. there was six months between when the Supreme Court actually officially handed down uh, the Dobbs decision and I think maybe two months of, of sort of the leaked report until it became official. Sure. Um, but having the Supreme Court in the headlines gives the uh, Democratic Party a boogeyman that they kind of already have with House Republicans given that uh, Republicans have the majority in that chamber but things like we're seeing with um, an affirmative action case and how that's sort of uh, really leaning into Republicans um, stance about diversity and discrimination and things like that. Um, that's something that really incentivizes voters because as people like to say, you know, elections matter. And, right. and because Donald Trump was able to appoint point three of the conservative justices that, that made up of that six justice uh, majority. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're probably gonna see things come down with like the student loan forgiveness program, which um, basically was seen as an outreach to younger voters right. for before the midterm elections. I don't know exactly whether, like there's a lot of reporting about how Biden wasn't always behind the plan or at least as generous as the one that he proposed. So maybe in the end, the Supreme Court can also be a help as opposed right. to just a hindrance. Sure, but it is a growing list of liberal policy priorities that this Supreme Court seems to be ruling against. No, you're, yeah, you're exactly right. There are lots of things that are on the docket um, 
and I think that they, uh, it just is, it's like a, kind of the Nancy Pelosi for Republicans. We've got the mm -hmm. Supreme Court and, and justices like Clarence Thomas, which have been really a rallying cry because of ethics concerns that, that Democrats have about him. Mm -hmm. And so finally, President Trump, former President Trump, has called the current president Sleepy Joe for a long time. But we've learned that maybe there's a good reason he's sleepy. Well, maybe, well, exactly, because he's not sleeping well, because of That's his right. sleep apnea, you know, you're exactly right. Um, so maybe, you know, the president has always been quite good at, the former president has actually been quite good at branding. Mm -hmm. um, we sort of learnt, or reporters asked questions because we saw lines on the side of the president's face. Mm -hmm. um, turns out that he's been using a CPAP machine uh, they wouldn't say exactly when it first started, they just used the word recently, mm -hmm. um, but they sort of really point to the fact that they've been really open. I think um, when he was running as uh, former President Barack Obama's vice president, they actually, that's when they disclosed it. Mm -hmm. um, and sleep apnea is a fairly common condition. E exactly, exactly. Um, but I, what I thought was really funny is in talking to White House aides, I mean, they obviously say that they are the most transparent administration. Sure. I mean, it took questions um, to elicit this information. So mm -hmm. whether that is actually accurate is one story. But right. I thought it was really funny is one of them sort of tried to equate uh, the president to uh, Tom Cruise and Top Gun, so, so like the same lines from from his helmet equipment from when he he was acting in that. And I was, uh, I thought that that was a bit of a stretch, but we'll see how voters kind of react to it. I mean, we already have concerns about the president's age. Mm -hmm. uh, sleep apnea is very common with people that particularly are older, um, but it just sort of leans into that caricature that he himself is actually owning on the campaign trail now. I mean, Tom Cruise and Joe Biden, two people who were famous in the 1980s. Exactly. Thank you, Naomi. You can read Naomi and the rest of our political team's coverage at WashingtonExaminer.com.